I think I know quite a few of you, but for those of you that don't know me, my name is um, Stephanie Paletti, and I have, Britt and I have been working for uh, Room to Read in Paris for about five years now. And I know that a lot of you are quite familiar with Room to Read's work, but Kemport, uh, we're going to talk about it again, because it's so good. So, um, And I know that there are new people here this evening. So. Room to Read is a global NGO uh, that puts into place educational programs around the world, mostly in Asia and Africa. And there are two main pillars to the work that we do. One is the uh, literacy program, and the other is the girls' education program. Although, for those of you uh, that do know our work, there is an exciting development this year, which I'll be talking about in just a second. There's a third pillar to our work now. So, the literacy program it's an inspiring program, a very holistic program, which works with boys and girls at primary school level, and particularly grade, the equivalent grades of um, sort of CP, CMA, uh, CP, CO1, CO2, uh, sort of six to seven year olds. And we really concentrate on putting into place in primary schools all of the elements necessary so that children can become fluent readers. Now. We only work in particularly disadvantaged uh, communities across Asia and Africa, and we, we only work with ministries of education. We, we do not parachute ourselves into countries and um, decide that we're sort of going to take over our education system. We work very, very closely with ministries of education. So what are these elements that we put into place that are, that are so vital for children if they are going to learn to read and write? Well, the first is quite simply infrastructure. Um, it seems an, an obvious thing, I suppose, but if you haven't got um, a safe, hygienic, uh, secure school schoolhouse, it's going to be very difficult uh, for children to come to school every day. And we, we have examples of this. We uh, Just to give you two examples, in Bangladesh, for example, we... Um, we, we began working on in the sandbank area in Bangladesh, and children were being taught literally on the sandbanks. And then in the monsoon, in the monsoon uh, uh, period of the year, um, that they couldn't go to school. They just, yeah, the, the, basically the area where they would sit and be taught disappeared. In South Africa, we built a school where a teacher had been uh, teaching children under a tree, basically. So infrastructure is uh, particularly important. Um, Another crucial element of this program is teacher training. Um, so we collaborate very, very closely with all of the ministries of education in the countries where we work to bring teachers up to date with uh, pedag pedagogical skills. Uh, in many of the places where we work, this just simply wasn't the case. They didn't have the skills necessary, and when they had been trained, uh, they had been trained in more well, particularly old-fashioned methods. So we work very hard to make sure that um, all of the teachers uh, that we come into contact with have the skills to teach children how to read and write. And then I think my favorite part of this program is the local language uh, book publishing um, program. <coughs> so when Room to Read first began, um, and I, I, I could go into detail here, but then we'd still be here at midnight. But anyway, the, um, basically the, we, the places that we were working, children had no books. And so when John Wood, um, the founder of Room to Read, started out, he basically went on a huge book collect in the United States and took these books to Nepal, uh, the first country that we started working in. There was a big donation from Scholastic, and he thought, great, that's fantastic. Look, we're bringing all of these books to Nepal. And as an organization that monitors very closely our impact, we were surprised and disappointed to realize that actually, despite the fact that children had books, they actually weren't making very much progress with their reading and writing, and that obviously is because these books were in English. Now, if you have children or grandchildren, um, and you're a French or English speaker, if your child starts school in Grand Section or CP, and they're a French or English speaker, for example, and all of their books are in German, they're not going to be making <laughs> enough progress. Now, so we thought, okay, silly us, Let's do something about this. Let's let's get uh, let's get these books in Nepali and Khmer and Vietnamese and Swahili, and so we set out to raise money to to buy them. Except that there weren't any because publishing is a for profit industry, and these were places that were simply too poor to buy books, so nobody made them. 
So um, what we did in every country where we work was set up um, a children's book publishing industry. We are the biggest children's book publisher that you've never heard of. Well, actually, a lot of you have heard of us now, but I think you take my points anyway. So, um, so we reached out to local writers, to universities, to local illustrators, and we produced, um, we produced a publishing industry which provides culturally relevant and age-appropriate school books and fiction books for the children in our schools. And even though the cost of creating one book is, is, is substantial, it actually only costs on average one euro um, to uh, run, run, a, run a copy of this book off. And so we, we, we were sort of reasonably um, efficient at doing this, financially efficient at doing this. Um, so then we provide the schools with these books, but even that isn't enough because actually a lot of these communities have had very, very little access to books and to reading. And so within every room to read school, which by the way are public schools run by the, the Ministries of Education, we would raise funds to create a school library and provide, you know, fill the library uh, with these local language books. And we spend three years training the librarian uh, who, you know, her, this, the role of the librarian is so important. Uh, we saw this in, in Sri Lanka and us. The kids were just overjoyed to come into the library. Um, she knows how to, um, which children uh, should be reading which books. Um, she knows how to monitor how many checkouts there are. She knows how to um, make sure that the children are actually reading the books as well. It's a really vital role. I think librarian is a vital role in, in, in any community, but particularly where we work, because our libraries, our school libraries, are the only access that these children will have to books, and they are a vital part of the children learning to read and write. Now, um, you, you've all got a fact sheet. If you haven't, there are still some at the, uh, at the desk, at the entrance. But, for example, our results in 17 years, 8 million books have been checked out around the world. We have distributed more than, more than 20 million uh, children's books, and we have trained more than 10,000 teachers. So I think that's quite, a, I think we can be quite, quite proud of, of that result. Um, <coughs> So that's the, that's the literacy yes. program, have I forgotten anything? Yeah, yeah. Um, now the girls' education program, another completely inspiring program. Um, what we noticed when we started the literacy program was that at the end of primary school, girls were dropping out of, of school age 12 <coughs> at an alarming rate. Now, um, we know, that, you know, the facts are out there, we know that educating girls is really one of the keys to eliminating poverty. Um, if you educate a girl up until the age of 18, uh, she will have fewer children. She will get married later. Her own children will uh, be in better health, as indeed will she, and she will educate her own children. That's crucial. If a mother is educated, even if she remains relatively poor, she will make sure her, ch her children get an education. So really educating women is, um, there's a ripple effect. You're not just educating one person, but the effect of educating that person is really very, very important. And, um, you know, I think there has been a spotlight on girls' education in the last few years. I know that Hillary Clinton has uh, talked a lot about it. Uh, we've seen, you know, Malala on the world stage talking about girls' education, but Room to Read were actually pioneers in the field of girls' education. Before, it was um, really quite so, um, so, a la mode, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Talking about literacy. <laughs> um, and, to the ex and I'm gonna explain a little bit more about the program. Um, again, it's not just about paying uh, school fees. A lot of the schools that we work in are public schools, they're not necessarily fee paying. But what would happen was that if parents um, couldn't afford to keep all of their children in school in the sense that they couldn't afford the uniform or they couldn't get their children to school because they lived in rural areas, they would pull the girls out. Or maybe, uh, maybe there were cultural barriers whereby, you know, um, well, at 12 years old, it was time to go work in the, the, the rice fields and maybe by 13 or 14 look to marry their daughters up and they would start having babies. Um, so obviously this is quite a sensitive issue and we don't want to just be the Western NGO that sort of parachutes into the country and starts telling them what they should be doing. Right. So we don't do that. We actually
actually work only with locals, whether it is teachers or the social mobilizers who are so vital um, to the girls' education program. So these are local women, and when I, when I say local, they really tend to, I'm not just talking about coming from the country in question, they really tend to come from um, the, the, the regions that they're working in. And they know the language, they know how culturally, they know the cultural obstacles facing girls who want to get an education. They know the, the difficulties for the families. They understand the issues. They work very, very closely with entire communities to help them understand why it is so important that their daughters should go to school and stay there until the age of 18. And they work very much between the schools. These people are employed by Room to Read, so they, they work very much with the schools and the parents, bringing them into the schools a lot as well so that they can understand what their daughters are doing, <coughs> listen to any questions or concerns that they may have. And they work individually, with, indivi well, not individually with the girls, but with, with girls in groups. And something that is called the Life Skills Program. Because it isn't really enough. These are often girls who have who are going to school for the first time. The, f the first people in their communities ever to go to school after, say, the age of 9, 10, or 11. And so they often need uh, you know, a, lot of, a lot of help, a lot of support. And we work very hard to help them build their self-confidence, to understand their rights, reproductive rights, and well, all sorts of rights in, in terms of the law, and in terms of what an education can bring them and of what they're going to be capable of doing with that education. Now, um, I'll give you, uh, you know, one example of that. Um, I traveled to Laos with Room to Read to visit some of the programs there, and I met a girl who um, was an alumni of the girls' education program, and um, she, I'm actually a translator, and she told me that she wanted to be a translator. She was studying French and translation at university, she was the first girl in her family to go to school, and she wanted to work for the government. And she told me that she had figured out that if she was able to, to become a translator for the government, she would be able to support her 11 brothers and sisters at home. Um, that's a huge leap forward. She was not only going to be um, economically autonomous herself, and aside from the sort of moral question of educating girls, but she was going to be able to help her entire family now, the Life Skills Program is a particularly important part of the Girls' Education Program, and we're very good at it. We've done a lot of research, we constantly monitor the results of everything we do, and the Brookings Institute in Washington, D.C. has started to work with Room to Read on uh, the Life Skills Program. They are so impressed with the work that we have been doing. So, have I forgotten any there? Is that very good? Um, so, to date, we have... More than 47,000 girls are on the program, and a full, I think this year we are at nearly 75% of those girls will go on to some form of tertiary education uh, or training. So I think that's, again, uh, a pretty, pretty impressive uh, result. And then the third part of our work, which is new this year, is something called the Accelerator Program. Now, um, Room to Read, came into existence uh, 17 years ago. Um, and what we, we, so far we have worked in 10 core countries. Uh, seven of them are in Asia and three of them are in Africa. Um, we, only will, we will only go and work in a country when, when, when we are asked to go and work there. Um, but it costs a lot of money to start working in a country, around $5 million. Um, so when we move into a country, we like to work there as much as possible to get the biggest impact uh, from our financial investments there. So if we are producing um, books in a local language, you know, we want to be able to distribute as many of them. If we are uh, you know, working with ministries of education to train teachers, we want to train as many teachers as possible before we move on to another country. However, demand for our work was increasing. And we just couldn't, uh, we, we couldn't meet that demand. And so Room to Read have been working in San Francisco for the last uh, three years on the Accelerator Program, which is basically a transfer of knowledge. It is saying to national governments and indeed some NGOs, this is our model, this is how we've done it, this is what we do, and we're going to train you in a lot of detail. It's not just kind of handing over a manual, we're going to train you in a lot of detail, and you can do this, but we're not going to move into that country. So this year, 
we began the accelerator program in Indonesia, in Rwanda, in Grenada, and in a Syrian refugee camp in Jordan. So this year we produced our first books in Arabic. Um, and I think it's a, it's a program I'm particularly proud of. I think that it is inspiring and it should, um, I think, help us reach more children um, more quickly. Uh, and on that point, we have to date reached in 17 years 11.6 million children with our programs. And I would also just like to mention to you that we are particularly economically and fiscally responsible. So for every euro or dollar that you give, um, 84 uh, cents go straight to the programs and the rest pay the salaries of our staff around the world in program countries. Um, and that means that I think for the 10th year running, we have had the highest rating from Charity Navigator, the uh, watchdog organization in the United States. Um, so there we are. That's in a nutshell, room to read. Um, I'm very grateful for you all to come for, to you all for coming along and supporting us this evening, uh, for your generosity in doing so. Um, we have a matching campaign throughout the month of December, which means that a sponsor, a corporate sponsor in the United States, will be doubling every uh, every donation that is made throughout the month the month of December. So. If anybody would ever like to make another one, you can do, and you all have my contact, um, my, my uh, email address, so please don't hesitate. Um, I'd like to thank David and Becky once again for their hospitality and generosity and support. And I'd like to thank Jake for being here this evening and supporting us too. And without further ado, I'll... First of all, thanks to everybody for coming out tonight and contributing to this, this terrific cause. Um, special thanks on my part to Sheila, who first approached me, and to uh, Britt and Stephanie and the rest of the Room to Read team for this invitation. And thank you so much to Becky and David Tepfer, who are such great friends, wonderful hosts, and cherished members of the international community in Paris. Um, I have to confess that before this, invi before this invitation, I, I had not heard of, of Room to Read. Um, but what I've learned has been amazing. What I've read on the website, what I learned tonight, I'm, I'm really, really impressed by the work the, that, that you do. Um, I love that organizations like this exist and are thriving. And, uh, and I was particularly struck by something I read on the Room to Read website. When a child learns to read, they can write their future. And it made me think of a question I get all the time, which is, um, how does one become a writer? And my answer is that every writer starts out as a reader. The title of my little talk tonight. It's the passion for reading that leads to the passion for writing. Uh, most writers um, at a fairly young age are captivated by that special communion that exists between a reader and an author, by the way books and stories can provoke thoughts and feelings and conjure up whole worlds. And after a while, you want to be on the other end of that relationship. You want to be the one provoking thoughts and feelings and conjuring up whole worlds for readers. I was a voracious reader from the time I learned how, and the first literary characters I remember identifying with were King Arthur, Robin Hood, and Sherlock Holmes, <laughs> three Englishmen. I also loved the mysteries of Agatha Christie. So even though I was growing up down the street from Yankee Stadium, the first short story I ever wrote at age 12 was a murder mystery set in a mansion on the English moors. <laughs> I wasn't quite sure what the moors were, but anyway, an inspector from Scotland Yard showed up to investigate, and yes, the butler did it. As much as I enjoyed making up that story, it was only later that year and the year after that I realized I wanted to be a writer. It happened when I read four works that completely changed my consciousness, and those works were Black Boy, Richard Wright's memoir about growing up in the Deep South at the beginning of the 20th century, <clears throat> The Bluest Eye, 
Toni Morrison's first novel, A Raisin in the Sun, the play by Lorraine Hansberry, and Go Tell It on the Mountain, James Baldwin's autobiographical first novel. What struck me about those four works was that it marked the first time I had seen people like myself, people like my family and our friends, that is to say ordinary African Americans, in literature. And when I saw that the lives of people like us could be transformed into literature, it made me think, maybe I'd like to do that someday. I remember how moved I was by Baldwin's book, which is about a young man growing up in a difficult family in Harlem. I was growing up in a difficult family in the Bronx. And I remember asking my teacher, who is James Baldwin? And the first thing he said was, he lives in Paris. And I found that to be such an exotic idea that someone <laughs> with a background like that would live in Paris, which I only knew from television. So at age 12 or 13, just as I was starting to think that someday I might like to be a writer, I also thought, well, maybe someday I'd like to be a writer in Paris. <laughs> Let me turn to another question I get all the time. Can you teach someone how to be a writer? And my answer is, no, you can't. But you can, through careful reading of very good writers, explore the different elements that work together to create powerful narratives. And by exploring those elements in your own writing, you can begin to get a sense of how it's done. So while you cannot teach someone how to be a writer, you can examine how good writers hook the reader with the first lines of a story. How does a writer develop a character, find the voice of a narrator? How does one create a mood or construct a plot? How do you find the best ending for a story? All of these elements can be examined and put to use in your own work. I've directed many, many creative writing workshops over the past 24 years in both English and French. I've worked with participants from all over the world and ranging in age from 12 to 80 something. And some of the most gratifying teaching experiences I've had have been with students in the banlieue parisienne, the working class suburbs of this city where so many immigrants and children of immigrants live. I'd like to share with you an essay I wrote about a three session workshop I conducted sponsored by a French literary association La Maison des Écrivains. This workshop took place in what is certainly the most grim, most bleak suburb I've visited in this country, the town of Grigny. February 7th, 2014. We start with a game of word association. What do you think of when you think of the United States of America? Hands fly up. Las Vegas, one student exclaims. Hollywood, another one offers. Statue of Liberty, hip hop, twin towers, money, guns. The students in this ninth grade class at Collège Jean Villard in Grigny are enthusiastic and polite. Their professor, Annie Giamaranaro, has one of the most precious qualities a teacher of adolescence can possess a natural authority. She has the air of a favorite aunt, cheerful but a little bit stern. You like her, but you know instinctively that you better not mess with her. <laughs> Annie is retiring at the end of the semester after 33 years at this college or middle school. Both parents of one of the students in this class were Annie's students back in the 1980s. The mayor of Grigny is also a former student of Annie's. So is the deputy mayor. Mm -hmm. We spend the first of our three sessions talking about my native country. The kids are inquisitive. I give them a capsule history of African Americans from the first arrival of slaves in the American colonies in 1619 to the re-election of President Barack Obama in 2012. This is to provide some historical context for the two memoirs they are reading. Black Boy, Richard Wright's account of growing up in Mississippi in the early 20th century, and Bourgeois Blues, my book about my relationship with my father and the evolution of American racial politics from the 1930s to the 1980s. The first session goes quite well. 
But this, in a way, has been the easy part. I haven't asked the students to write yet. February 14th. In the spirit of my book and of Richard Wright's, I propose to the students that they each write a memory. I will give them an hour and a half to write down some event from their 14-year-old lives that left them memorably moved, shaken, or amused. I had decided before the session to enlist the help of another literary ancestor, Chester Himes. In the first volume of his autobiography, The Quality of Hurt, he wrote of his harrowing fall down an elevator shaft when he was 17 and working as a bellboy at a hotel. Annie read the passage aloud to the class in French, and I'm going to read it to you now in English. <clears throat> I had been at the hotel a couple of weeks and had just gotten sufficiently adapted to the job so that I wasn't always tense and nervous and afraid I'd drop a tray or do something wrong. When one morning I stopped in front of the closed elevator doors to kid with the checkers, as the girls were called, trying to screw up my courage to ask one for a date. Realizing what I wished to do, they laughingly steered the conversation to topical chit-chat and began recounting the happenings when the famous Hollywood dog star, Rin Tin Tin, had had a suite there. It was with a sense of letdown that I turned away and pulled open the elevator doors and, looking at them accusingly, stepped inside. I fell past the floor below in the high-ceilinged basement between 30 and 40 feet. I landed upon the heavy steel plate of the springboard that is at the bottom of every elevator shaft. I didn't lose consciousness. I remember the sensation of falling through space and landing on a solid platform with the feeling of my body spattering open like a ripe watermelon. I remember calling for help in a tiny voice. My mouth felt as though it were filled with gravel. Later, I discovered that it was only my teeth. My chin had hit something that cut the flesh to the bone, broke my lower jaw, and shattered all my teeth. My left arm hit something and both bones broke just above the wrist so that they came out through the skin, dead white with drops of blood in the bone fractures. My spine hit something and the last three vertebrae were fractured. The waiters came to pull me out, peering over the lip of the shaft with the flattened planes and whitened eyes of black faces in shock. And I remember crying out when they seized my broken arm. Then several jumped down into the shaft and lifted me out as tenderly as though I were a newborn baby. I remember seeing Mr. Smith's shocked face and tears flowing down the faces of the two white girls. Then the ambulance came and I was rushed to the nearest hospital, a big new modern hospital on 105th Street facing the park. I remember the expressions of regret on the aquiline faces of the two staff doctors who walked slowly toward the ambulance, shaking their heads while the red-faced driver expostulated dramatically. It occurred to me that a scene was being reenacted, that I had seen it all before in the White Hospital in Pine Bluff, Arkansas, when my brother was rushed there and the white staff doctors had turned him away. So in Cleveland, Ohio, three years later, in 1926, I too was turned away because there was no space, no empty bed, but I was given a massive injection of morphine. Himes' writing is breathtakingly vivid. After Annie read the passage in French, you could feel a frisson among the students. All right, Anne Nance, it's time for you to write. At first, most of them seemed stumped. They stare vacantly into space or at the blank page in front of them. There's a fair amount of whispering and giggling. Suddenly I remember the famous book by Georges Perec. I write the title on the board. If you're having trouble getting started, you can begin your text with the words, je me souviens, I remember. This seems to help. Slowly, one by one, they start to bend over their pages. A couple of boys complain that they don't feel inspired. I repeat the mantra that I use in all my creative writing workshops, 
usually with adult participants. Concentration is more important than inspiration. First, you have to concentrate. Then, inspiration will come to you. Annie and I walked among the students, encouraging some who were struggling, reading the works in progress of others. One girl clearly does not need our counsel. From the time I said, write, Renee has been hunched over her notebook, scribbling furiously, producing page after page. When, after an hour and a half, I announce time's up, Renee stops, shakes out her right hand, twirls her wrist. She smiles. She's written so much, she got a cramp. April 4th. <clears throat> Between the second and third sessions, Annie typed up the students' writings and emailed them to me. The texts were always interesting, sometimes wondrous. Memories ran the gamut from enjoyable or ordinary, a family picnic, a family picnic, a fishing trip, a visit to Disneyland Paris, to the painful and traumatic. Perhaps inspired by Chester Himes, several students wrote of accidents, illnesses, urgent trips to the hospital. A couple of students produced works of pure fiction, including one tale of warring jungle tribes who come together to fight a corporation that wants to despoil their homeland. Then there was the text of Renee, the girl who wrote so much, so intensely, that her writing hand cramped up. When I first spoke with the Maison des Écrivains about having students read my memoir, there was some concern about the sometimes disturbing content of the book, specifically the descriptions of my father's drunken violence and the effect it had on our family. I've observed over the years since the book was first published in the USA that many young readers have actually found solace in some of the more unsettling material. If they had experienced familial violence themselves, my book reassured them that they were not alone in this trauma and that they could live through it and transcend it. <laughs> Renee's text was excruciating in its honesty about the family violence she had witnessed. It was also beautifully written. At the start of our final session, I announced that each student will have his or her text read aloud. I give them the choice. They can read their text themselves or have Annie or me read it. The 22 texts were read. Sometimes there was laughter, sometimes gasps of surprise, but always a sense of concentration, an intensity of listening in the class. After each reading, the students applauded. Annie and I had decided to save Renee's text for last. Renee read it herself, leaving out a couple of passages she felt were too intimate to share with her classmates. When she finished reading, there was a stunned silence in the classroom, followed by an enthusiastic, somewhat awed applause. My thoughts returned to the end of our previous session. After Renee had finished writing, as she shook out her cramped wrist, she had smiled and said to Annie, Madame, now I know what I want to do in life. I want to be a writer. <laughs> so, thank you.